I'd like to call the special joint meeting agenda of the Parks and Recreation Committee and the Plan Commission for Monday, September 12th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. to order. Um, he's noted at 6.43 p.m. We're starting a little late. Roll call and declaration of a quorum by Secretary Parker. All righty. Plan Commission. Cronin? Here. Sagami? Here. Ermeling? Here. Current? Here. Jordan? Here. Bumper? Here. And Snell? Present. And Maloney and Deason are excused. And then uh, Parks and Recreation, Ermeling? Here. Feeney? Here. Clark? Here. Clavino? Here. And Easter? Here. All right. Um, public comment. Do we have anybody online or here in the audience that wishes to make a public comment? Second time. Do we have anybody online or in the audience? Anybody with their hands up? No. Um, anybody online or in the audience that wishes to make a public comment? Hearing none, we'll move forward. Um, new business, item number four, presentation by DC Everest Area School District and Somerville Architects on proposed Green Hex Turner Community Center project. I'm uh, Dwayne Grove with Somerville Architects and Engineers. I'm the project architect. I'm trying to log in here. I clicked on the Zoom link. How do we? Okay, from the there. Oh, we'll see. Okay. Did you say that you would zoom in and then you could do it? She would do it now. She could do it. I know. I was in the office and I looked and it was cool. Look on the agenda. Been asking for a password. Later, it's just sitting there, thing up there. Yeah. It's not on my internet. It wasn't supposed to be on. Supposed to do it. I was going to do that. Do I? Now I can shut it off because there, wasting energy. Kids have got a nice picture there. Yeah. Yeah, like for whatever reason, the Zoom site even, like clicking on it, just yeah, it's getting bad. It's not high. I think it's not high. Let's come back. Oh, there it was. You've got a traffic count, right? I ask them if they're going to take their own traffic to study also. Traffic oh, yeah. also. So. Yeah. Yeah. section is the best people. Not lining up. Both of them are on a curve, though. I mean, yeah. He's, he's not lining up. Right. So, what is the intersection of masculine and scriptural? I don't even take I cut up. They come up out of this one, and this one ain't one better. No, but it's better because it used to be the thing to keep on. Yeah. There's a few of them around the border, is the same way, doesn't it? Yeah, you can't see when you're yeah. standing at the parking at that yeah. intersection. You mm -hmm. can't have a hard time to see that. This one is not the one on the street side. If I'm taking my next to our first brewer's thing, I guess I must connect. Yeah, she's a lot of That's when I saw it. I didn't think my stadium around the first time. Mm -hmm. Oh, why oh, 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 you know. 
I've never gotten a Buddhist as a, you know, in a town stadium, walking from underneath the stadium up into it, and smacking that ball at the sticks over your head. You know, mm -hmm. I've never, never gotten over that. We had Zoom meetings with that. <laughs> yeah, we used them all the time. Huh. Just used it this morning. It's a Sunday morning. I got done sitting around. I I like to see the have a Okay, I think we can get when this gets up. We'll get going here and we'll show you because once we show you what we're up to, you'll appreciate why we're taking so long so you can see it. Sir, do you mind step like can you speak into the microphone so anybody online can hear you? Oh, and then if you wouldn't mind sharing your name and address for the record, please. Yeah, sure. Um, okay. <laughs> Okay, but I will have to sit down when I, okay. Okay, so my name is Dwayne Grove. I'm with uh, Somerville Architects and Engineers, and I'm the project for the, or project architect for the project at DC Everest, the Green Hack Turner Community Center. And there's a bunch of people here with me who can also speak about it. Um, my address, if you need that, is E8289 Hickory Haven Lane, New London, Wisconsin. Good? Okay, all good. So we've got uh, some other people here to uh, talk as well. You guys want to stand up and there we go. These are representatives from the school district. Hello, uh, Jason Jablonski, Director of Buildings Grounds for DC Everest, uh, 9306 Lambert Street in Rothschild, Wisconsin. Real close. Thank you. Andrew Mall, Director of Community Services, uh, Student Safety and Special Projects, 4102 River Bend Road. I'm Lindsay Lewitsky. I am the DCRS Education Foundation President, who is the fundraising arm of this project. I live at 1701 Green Vistas Drive in Wausau. Okay, so I understand the, the intent of this actually was to, to show you the building, right? Is that the, the idea to see what the building looks like, how it's going to function, and that kind of stuff. So that's why uh, representatives from DC Everest are here. I'll walk you through a video of the building so you can see it, and we'll describe what it looks like once I transfer this over to the screen. He just needs to share. He has to give him access, don't you? He has to ask. Oh. Should we go to share? We don't restrict that. Yeah, so I'm sure. Go through the video. I'll just help Dwayne along as it goes through the video. <laughs> okay, so I'm um, sharing screen. Yep. Excuse me here, I gotta get rid of some of this screen stuff. That. That. Okay. Ah, okay, so there's a delay. Sorry about that. Okay, so uh, we want to we'll kick off the presentation here and I'll zoom in. Basically, understand this is the campuses of DC Everest High School. Alderson is to the up on the drawing. Jelinek is off to the left. Uh, you can see basically where the building goes here in red is the location of parking and the tennis courts and the existing greenhouse fill houses here in the green. That's basically where the building goes. If we zoom in a little closer on the building itself, I'll try to zoom in a little further here. There we go. Okay. The existing Green Hack Fieldhouse, the lower level, this is the ice rink level and then the locker room level. That is the main level then of the turf arena. So the turf arena is here, the field house in green, obviously. This little 
orange area here is the main entry. And it's important to understand that what's happening here, we're taking the main entrance, which is now up several flights of stairs to get into the upper level of Green Hack, is now gonna be down at the parking lot level. So you won't need to traverse the steps going up. And basically the main um, entrance to Green Hack right now is this area, here you see my hand moving here, that's the main entrance. This area right here in green is where those steps are. So you'll be able to see in a couple of renderings and as we walk through the video, um, what we're gonna do with that area there. Um, on the ground floor, we have, as, as I said, the main entrance, we've got a check-in desk, a monumental inside stair up to the main level of the Green Hack Center. Down below on the other side of the elevator, we have the check-in desk, as I said, um, day lockers for anyone who needs lockers in this area in front of three team rooms, these rooms in purple. These would double as um, not really locker rooms, but double as uh, meeting rooms and also rooms for the team to meet in prior to events. The field house itself with storage along one side, which is faces east, these little black lines here along the east face are retractable bleachers. We've got three lanes of uh, sprint track and we're looking at a full size soccer field. I'll show you a diagram a little bit later of all the fields that we're presenting again. A, what's the approach the of that soccer field? Excuse me? What's the dimension of it? The full size soccer field? Right. Um, it's, there you go, 120 yards by 70 yards. <clears throat> so it's a full size football field plus bigger on the sides. Um, I've got a diagram that can show that. Right here. That's the size of an outdoor soccer field. Yes. So the outside here in the red is the full size soccer field. In yellow is the full size football field. There's also full size lacrosse. We've got two softball, um, or, yeah, softball on either ends. Um, so we've got under 200 feet then from uh, first or from uh, home plate out to the edge of the turf, and then the field itself can be divided into two half court soccer fields. There is planned to be three dividing nets, so we'll be able to divide this yet into four individual turf surfaces, basically 100 feet wide by 200 feet long. So plenty of room for even four groups to be practicing at the same time. Go back to our floor plan. Um, the service drive back to the back of Greenhouse or Green Hack then is moved to the west and the north. So that's our fire access lane and also service to the back of the greenhouse green hack facility. If I move up to the floor right above it, so now we're on the main level of the green hack center. So here's the concession stand and the existing lobby. This right now is the vestibule, this little area here. I wish I could zoom in closer, try that. So then on the upstairs level, then we've got um, offices, another meeting room, and eSports simulator rooms for like uh, golf, and lots of informal seating up here. So you don't need to be a spectator actually uh, inside the field house to enjoy the views of what's happening. So we do have these uh, casual viewing area. Then, on the, then you can actually go into the arena itself like in box seats, and there's raised bleachers that can lever out into the athletic field on both the south and east. These are the east and this is the south. So what I can do from that is go into a, find the right program here, a little video which shows that, there we go. And I'll stop and we'll talk about it as we go. So if we're looking at the rendering here, 
Um, basically, you can see in the center here, an arch inside the glass. That's more or less the location of the existing arch that's on the Green Hack Center right now. So where the stairs are becomes this plaza in front of the facility. That monumental stair that I talked about is tucked over here. See my cursor moving in here, facing out into the, or with views from the inside out onto the plaza. So we'll start the view, slide to the side here. So now you're looking Northwest. This is the main entrance. Obviously you can get our branding uh, front and center. These little bump outs here in the building, those are those uh, raised platform viewing areas that we'll be able to see more of as we move forward. We'll just slide right into the, okay, so right inside the main vestibule door, basically you're looking at the entrance into the field house. Stop it right there. So we've got um, plenty of glass viewing from the main level of the entrance into the turf arena. As we continue around, this is the check-in desk, which is right there by the vestibule. We've got the elevator front and center now. And beyond in the center of the screen, there are the day lockers. They're not full height, they're like uh, four feet tall. And then beyond that are those meeting and team rooms. As we continue over, here's the monumental grand staircase, which leads to the upstairs. And it's important to note right now that um, if you're accessing the ice and the hockey locker rooms, you would just basically go towards this drinking fountain and hang a right, and then you'd be at the locker rooms all at that level. As we go upstairs, we're at the top of the stairs where we just were looking before. You can see there's another platform up top here, and that's where I talked about the casual seating for looking out into the arena. And upstairs, as in downstairs, we have two sets of restrooms. Ahead of us is a door that leads to the offices, and then also one of those e-sports rooms is here in the side. We'll go up to that platform level now. And as you can see, you can look out into the parking lot off to the right and plenty of views out into the field. There's another shot of that casual area upstairs. It is enclosed by glass. We used to be able to see out into the sports arena. Here's that other set of casual seating right outside the simulator rooms. And then down way far in the distance here, is another set as another meeting room. And hold on, we'll go down along here. The light coming from the right is one of those bump outs that I had talked about earlier. To give you a location where that is. Again, sort of a box seat view. Also on the south side of the arena, as you can see on the left-hand side here, we have another set of bleachers which cantilever out into the arena itself. Those are accessed from around the corner by that first meeting room. Uh, now we're inside the arena, and as I spin around here, so at this level you'd come into this area and then step down to access bleachers, but now you're actually in the arena. And you can see this, some of the sides of the massive steel, which holds the roof structure in place. So we've placed bleachers below, between those roof trusses. There's another bump out with seating and looking out into the parking lot. So there's a good connection between what's happening on the outside of the building and inside. See the bleachers down below us, big fields in front of you. Now looking all the way back from where we came. And now we're down on the ground level, right inside the main entrance door by the fields. So up top is the enclosed glass viewing area. 
bleachers are off to the left. And as we go way over to the other side of the field, you can see the giant windows we have facing north. We're gonna take advantage of north light and have plenty of light streaming in the north end of the building. And now this is from the north, looking towards the south. Um, we do have a all glass garage door over here in the corner, which opens out into the parking lot for loading into the facility. You can see we've got the bleachers off here, raised platform off to the left. And we'll just go down this sideline, get an idea. You see the pull out bleachers on the sides. What's the capacity with those bleachers? Yeah. We've got just under a thousand total for bleachers. So between the upper level and the lower level, we've got just under a thousand. And those glasses are bulletproof so they won't break with the soccer ball? <laughs> There's also a set of nets which go around the facility around the turf area. Yep. So when the, the critical area is like on the goal ends, right, will be protected. Yep. The netting is also retractable, so in the event that we run like graduation or something, we don't want that as an obstruction, so we'll be able to retract it up and have it, uh, it won't be there. So that's the video. Um, let me get back here. I had a series of renderings we could look at quick too. There you go. Is there anything like this on this scale in the greater north central Wisconsin area? No, I think Lindsay would be the closest one you think that's similar. Probably northern Michigan is the closest one, uh, but within 90 miles there's not one single full size indoor turf field. Um, Rhinelander would be the closest full size indoor turf field, but as we know, or as um, it is a it is a domed which is, has its advantages and but plenty of disadvantages. Um, so when we're looking at this facility, it's a, I mean, it's obviously still structured. It'll last forever, longer than all of us, which is, I think, a great benefit to this community. We will be climate controlling anything around the outside that's in that general kind of uh, space, but the, uh, the turf itself will not be. So there's no HVAC in the... There's HVAC, just not cooling. We're not gonna cool it. And no air conditioning, but there'll be heat and ventilation yeah. in that part of the facility. How, I mean, if you use it in the summer, then is there, I mean, are there doors that can be open to lawn? Well, the, the, they'd be able to use the HVAC system to pull outside air in, but we okay. wouldn't be, you know, these, these tubes across the top here, it, it's hard to see in the rendering, but that's part of the HVAC cooling system or HVAC heating system, but that'd be able to draw fresh air inside the building and exhaust it out. So we would be able to put fresh air into the building during the summer as well. Those are acting like an air intake? Excuse me? They acting like an air intake? Yeah, yes. So I see in the economic or of economic impact, uh, it's anticipated a million dollars per year. Um, is that more of a conservative estimate or uh, or um, based on current trends? Well, I'm Lindsay, she's got some uh, history on that. Uh, so that one million dollars is taken from the twenty-five thousand visits. Um, twenty-five thousand visits is what would be considered a comparable facility. Um, comparable. comparable Facilities are located in the Twin Cities metro area. The metro has over 30 full-size fields, um, so they they have it populated. So they only pull 25,000 visits in every year because they they're literally one within every 10 miles. Um, so we take that comparable, um, which is a very conservative, as you say, because within our area there's nothing within 90 miles. So we would very much anticipate, and we do anticipate people such as Marathon, Merrill, you know, Anago, Rapids, Stevens Point, Wapaka, even the Fox Valley coming over. 
on a nightly basis, essentially, to use the facility. Um, there also is then going to be overnight visits based off of the 50 plus miles away um, weekend tournaments, weekend things that happen, um, which is where a lot of the economic impact obviously happens um, overnight visitors. So 25,000 about um, and we took about 20% of those people would be overnight visitors, um, which is very, again, very conservative to get that number um, based off of the Department of Tourism's um, money spent per, do per person per day um, based off of overnight or day visitors. Um, what we do anticipate within five years, it would be 40,000 at least visits, um, which would obviously up, up the economic impact substantially. Um, but right now it's just a matter of there's no comparables. And honestly, it probably will take five years for people to understand that how to use the facility correctly, right? I mean, you, you're not gonna automatically just fill it in one night just because it's there. Um, we need leagues to form and, and get that, get people aware and informed on that. And that would be Aaron's job. <laughs> Um, you probably have a question as to probably how much or, or where we're at with our fundraising, um, because this is a, 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 although the district is, is fundraising for it, it's actually the DC Everest Education Foundation, which is a 501c3 nonprofit who is doing the fundraising. Um, all fundraising will be privately as in it's not, it's not tax dollars that are being used um, for this facility. Um, we currently set out about $29.6 million raised. Um, have a bit of a gap to go. We opened bids today, so we're going to, we have a meeting on Wednesday to, uh, to figure out where we're at, how much we have left. Um, but we do anticipate a ceremonial groundbreaking, I would call it, um, this fall, um, where we order, start to order product, um, which would be like steel things, things that have long lead times. Um, and then you'll see groundbreaking, uh, next fall well, spring ish. Um, uh, and then completion anticipated date. We'd like it open for uh, fall 2024 for that school year um, to start and really be rolling. Is this to be used by students during the school day? It certainly can be, yes. Um, so it, gym class could come in and use it, um, but it's also open for the community all day long. Um, so there's uh, the possibility that people will be on the walking track or you know they rented out a batting cage or, or using the meeting rooms. Um, we do anticipate a lot of team building activities happening here um, for corporate events because uh, why not come um, have your team building activity in a team room, go upstairs to the simulator or go down to the turf and play kickball or, or do or hit some balls in the batting cages um, and then go back up and finish your finish your team building or your, your corporate event um, that you have. We also do anticipate a lot of community events could happen here. Um, again, it'll get it'll be getting used to how to use the facility correctly, um, but certainly um, community events such as uh, Wasa events is uh, concerts on the square right now. They simply rain out on Wednesday night, right? Because there's no other building that that can handle that many people. This building certainly can handle that many people, um, and so we could easily move that inside on a on a summer night or honestly in winter. Um, there's not much to do here. <laughs> um, so we certainly could see concerts on the green in winter here or, you know, a community event where the district already owns some bounce houses and, and we bring other other nonprofits together and we could have a community night or two, you know, every bi-monthly or, or whatever it is in, in winter just to make sure, I mean, obviously this space is going to be used, but if we find a random Thursday or Friday night that that's open, that's certainly a possibility as well. Yep. The first time you have a tornado warning, what's the procedure? Sure. We, would use our, we would use our tornado areas that we have set up. So in our lower level, we have all those locker rooms, all cement and things like that too. So we'd have designated areas for that. To handle the, the, the numbers. Yeah, and all that goes into everything Dwayne has to put together too for the emergency plan and stuff. Traffic and parking, um, the additional 25,000 or 40,000 visitors. What does that look like for Alderson, Jelinek, that intersection? That probably stops a disaster now. So now you have 40,000 people in what? Uh, yeah, that's a Michael question. question. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, it's a per year, so it's not all at one time. Um, but Yeah, that number is over the course of a whole year. We do anticipate maybe we could have upwards of 1,000 people here for an event, right? Um, the upper lot where the old bus company was, that's going to get... Uh, turned into a parking lot. Um, so we're adding, do you have how many spaces that was? I don't know, like for civil plans, what are you talking? 
So yeah, we've got that whole area is earmarked to get uh, more parking and then the existing parking lot gets uh, revamped with a couple of new entrances and exits to kind of uh, one we've, I mean, we know if you've been around the senior high uh, and I see it every day, the kids, they just don't drive the best. Let's just say it, that, that age group. But so we're trying to fix some of that by doing some angle parking and some uh, different in and out uh, lanes and then moving some of our students into different parking lots, like our newest drivers will be the furthest away from the school. But that would also open that parking up for the events. So what's the total parking in here? Uh, I, gotta, I don't remember the exact amount. Dwayne has it on yeah, one of them. Current, uh, I think it's around 600 roughly. I think we added like, a, was it another 400 and some or 500? Don't quote me on that. Yeah. Right. Are there <laughs> more entrances off of the road, the roads? Because right now there's only two. really two and yeah. both of them the are awful. Yeah, the plan that we have right now are the one that we've kind of uh, focused on would be uh, we leave the one by old admin we add two uh, by the old bus company and then we take any traffic from the front of the high school and it has its own entrance and you can't use what we call student council drive which is that thoroughfare mm -hmm. you won't be able to get from the senior high into that lot because they use it like a drag strip <laughs> <laughs> We've been working with REI on that plan for probably about the last three or four months now. It's kind of the last piece to this puzzle. Yeah, I apologize. These drawings are set up for bidding the actual the field house work and not the parking lot work. So the, the drawings sort of overlap, but they're not giving me the numbers that you're asking for. Um, during so during get those, it should be part of the... We have not, they haven't submitted for this yet. You're just getting a preview. Yeah, and we did, I think we did send them just as a preliminary, just for uh, the fire department wanted to look at them. So I think they have a copy. Go on the site and look at them. You have them. Yeah. That was what 595 was the parking number current, right? Here we go. Mm -hmm. This thing, 882, proposed 976. Yeah, so a thousand spots. Yeah. But we only, but that's not the future parking, that's just the parking in front of so we that adds the extra. Oh, so that's that's not including where the bus, that's not where the bus is? Yeah. Okay. okay. How does this affect the gym, the, the, the building, as far as the entrance and the whatever to the gym? To the? Uh, the I'm the, the gym. Uh, the, Fitness center? Yes. Fitness center. So what it, what it does um, is it gives everybody a ground entrance, which helps out a ton with my members and everybody in general, because it gets icy there in the winter. That's a yes. kind of a treacherous step. So we've tried heating them. We've tried a lot of different things to make it better. And it's, it's always been a struggle. It also adds in an elevator right there front too, rather than walking through my building to get to it. So they can take the elevator if they need to up to the second floor and they walk back. The distance, it doesn't add a ton. Because you're coming in right here, and then where the orange is, that's right where you would normally come in. So it doesn't add a ton. It does add parking closer to the front entrance, and it gets rid of that front walkway, the steps. What they call a handicap lot, is that still going to be there? The lot will still be there. That will still be there, but the handicap spots are going to move to the front here. So where you see the new lot, that's where the new handicap, because obviously there's not an entrance over there. That doesn't help. So There will be an entrance from that way. Yeah, so right where Dwayne's circle is, that's where the handicap spots would be. And then you can see where the line goes into the front entrance. And the elevator is right there where he ended it, where it says check-in. Will any of these events or tournaments or whichever be available to take place during school hours? Sometimes we do that on a Friday. So, well, that, stand by. Here's where I'm going with this. Yep. The yard right now is full of cars, right? Yep. Park full. Yep. So now if I bring, not bringing 25,000 people in, but I'm bringing 200 people in for sure. a soccer game, right? Where these guys park on Alderson? So I only added 96 spots or 76 well, spots. Well, that doesn't count the other. That's not, so if you look where the bus part is, that's added spots that aren't included in there. And then we have the new admin building. So I don't know what they're doing. 
Uh, these are just bid documents for this building that we're looking at the building addition, but the school district is working on expanding on the upper left of that area there. So when they the submit way. the final plans, we'll look at all of that. It's right now they don't have that full picture of what that looks like. We've only seen pieces. I think when um, there's lots of existing uses on the site too. Okay, so when you guys had um, REI in here as well, the last thing that you guys brought in, the entrance showed right across from Keith. He's the one that was against it. The entrance, there was an entrance there, and then I believe that showed the parking over where the bus bar was as well. It right. did, and then we did send. I believe those were sent too. I believe those were here. So where do any feel put your cursor over where the old where the bus barn area is? There's added parking all through there, and it's all laid out. We can get you guys back the numbers. We just don't have them right here, but we have the numbers there. And then on the corner where the new admin building is, there's also parking. I think it even shows it on the left. There's parking added over there too. And there's two entrance and exits added on, on that side too. So when we do have stuff, usually it's between that buffer time. We might have come, people, a few people come in and practice and do stuff earlier, but as far as like a full on bet, so we do, we do craft shows and stuff. Setup usually happens then, but the actual thing doesn't take off till kids are out. Otherwise, it's it's too dangerous in that parking lot to have people come and go. Yeah. This, uh, this is a security or the ability to lock down between the facilities. In other words, if you're going to have an event during the day, how do you? So how our front. So any of those people traveling into the high school. So our front doors are locked all day during the school day. We actually buzz them in, same as we do at our school. So there's a camera there. We buzz the people in the front desk goes through our normal safe procedure and they buzz them into the front desk. And there's no way for the, the kids are going to have a way to get around that? I mean, to get into it? No, I mean, the front desk is right there. So no, the kids try to go through our doors because it's closer for parking and they all get sent around. So there's a, per there's a person at that front desk that mans it all day, just like we do the front desk at the high school. Yeah, we also have a corridor between the existing green heck and the senior high that has car readers and it's lockable. We will lock that down usually then so the kids can't get through. Yeah, one of the things that we're adding in here too, it might take a little bit to implement it, but we're actually putting in um, some door contact switches as well. So we'll know if a door gets propped open or, or those types of things. It's one of the things we would have, if anybody's got a big pot of money, they want to donate, I'd do it all across the whole district so we know. But uh, we definitely will be looking at doing that in most of our buildings in the near future. Uh, Michael? Yep. It's the massacre in Alderson and uh, Jelmex intersection. And of all this traffic? I mean, I guess that was one thing that we're suggesting we look at um, as part of the It should about. be looked at it because we're talking about thousand people leaving that facility. If that's a nightmare. And then they got only three exits. And right now is a problem. Let's put it that way. Yeah. I mean, when it's a hockey game, it's, it's difficult. Well, even Sunday, you know, Mount Olive lets out. It, you, yeah. It, I mean, you get backed up, but. <laughs> yep, you're right. Yep. Yeah, we usually get, I mean, just out of the high school, we might have anywhere upwards of, you know, six to 800 kids there that are driving, right? And you give them here, they all, at 245, they're, they're all leaving. So I would anticipate if you have a large event here, you'll have something similar to what you would see every day when kids leave the senior high. I mean, there's, again, only so much capacity, though, too, that we have. So, I mean, whether it's backed up on school property or backed up on the road, you know, eventually there's going to be some other restriction too. Unless everybody Maybe turning lane possibly. Yeah, I mean, some of it might be improvements though. They would maybe need to look at too, as far as I mean, I think. I think I saw you know you had some turn lanes maybe with the. And we have what we do is we added some lanes and we added just turnout lanes where you can only go either left or right depending on how you're coming in or going out. So you're trying to direct that traffic to just head out and they're going right in, right out. Is that what you're talking about? Right in, right out. Yeah. Right in, right out. Yeah. It depends on the on which exit or entrance it is, but some are yes. You can only go. You could still turn left, but you you could you have an option to just keep turning right out onto a road. You don't have to wait for all the other traffic. There you go. Yeah, there's the one there. There you go. 
Jason, the it's turf only too, right? You're not doing any other surfaces in there in the field house part. Well, it's turf, uh, and there's a jump pad. And well, the track log saying where you are you planning on doing alternate surfaces for different types of events? Not right now. Start okay. it up. I think it becomes a safety issue at that intersection. Just stop that. Well, okay, yeah, but still, even the <laughs> stop there, you got to improve the intersection. Yeah. The stop Any other questions? I don't have anything. Oh, we had. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. He has to stop this share, yeah. Yep. Okay. Does that work? Yep. Okay. Anybody else? No. Great. Uh, item number five, comprehensive outdoor recreation plan update and master plans for Kennedy and Prohaska parks. So um, early, well, I think it was uh, right at the end of the month, uh, we received proposals for the comprehensive outdoor rec plan update along with master plans for Prohaska at Thank Kennedy. you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you too. Um, Jen did send them out to both the planning commission and the park committee um, as they're quite extensive five plans they are all average 25 to 30, 30 pages. Um, it's a lot to put in the packet and review. So had some extra time to take a look at them if you want to get into the detail on those. Um, I also did, we also did draft a um, RFC with just some of the main information on like the comprehensive outdoor rec plan. Um, that how the villages had one for so long, um, the reasons to have one, et cetera, as far as like, you know, a plan for the parks for the next five years. Um, it also obviously is, it's one of those things where we're required to have them to apply for state or federal funding through uh, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Um, so we have received funding uh, for multiple projects and purchases in the past. Um, and it's something that we plan on continuing doing um, if we move forward with obviously any future development or acquisition of properties. Um, master plan discussions. Um, the master plan discussion regarding Prost Park uh, has been brought up previously, but it was brought up recently um, that it was something that we've purchased, we've owned it for um, multiple years and we haven't moved forward with doing anything with the property. Um, we are required to turn that into a park based on purchase, the purchase agreement with the process when the property was purchased. Uh, there was no timeline put on it, but it is required that when it is developed, that it would be developed as a park. So there's no other uses that that property could be used for. Um, <clears throat> and then the uh, Kennedy Park Master Plan, um, it's obviously uh, one of our biggest parks, most used parks. And we've, we had some meetings earlier this spring with the Sierra Youth Baseball, um, where they came in with a bunch of um, proposals that they had as far as improvements at the park, et cetera. Um, park and Rec Committee discussed it, you know, as far as, you know, is, are these improvements the right thing for the park? Are they, the proper placement, et cetera, layout, traffic flow, um, people flow, you know, uh, locations of each, of what everything is in the park right now, is it the proper placement of that? That is one of the things that's why you do a master plan is so for the future placement of items or installation development, um, you're putting it so it functions best in the location. So you don't just pop something in and then it totally impedes future use of something else within that area. Um, so that's one of the reasons that this was brought up a little bit faster was that there's a lot of improvements. They'd like to add some additional fields, um, et cetera, at the park, and is it the proper location for it? 
based on you know architectural engineering, uh, you know placing placing a field in this area. Does that make sense? Or where where should additional parking go? Uh, we were just talking like traffic flow with the Green Neck Turner Community Center. Obviously, you want that to work to function properly. Anytime you have a, a large area where there's a lot of people gathering, um, just getting them in and out, having proper amount of parking, etc. So, um, <clears throat> we did receive five five proposals for um, the. Uh, Comprehensive about direct plan, and we did receive five proposals for each of the um, master plans. Um, so the budgeted funds for the corp update was based on a uh, number that we got from a different consultant. That's why that number was put in the budget. Um, he had originally estimated about around eleven thousand five hundred for updating the corp. And then an additional 3,000 within that budget was for a master plan for the Prohaska property. Um, so that was based on the original consultant that did the work for our current corp, though, too. So obviously, there's a little advantage to some extent using the same consultant because he's already got the documents from drafting the corp five years ago. So as you'll see, there's a, quite a vast difference in price range of for all of this. Um, so you can see the lowest price came in for updating the Corp, uh, came from Cedar Corp. And then the highest price came in from HKGI out of Minneapolis. So like I said, there's a vast difference just based on obviously they're redrafting all the documents of what's in our existing Corp and then obviously update them also. Because a lot of that information carries through from each Corp to the next which is like our facilities, locations, uh, what we provide, et cetera, within our club. So, um, <clears throat> and then as far as the um, master plans, they vary quite significantly also uh, with Cedar Corp coming in at 5,000 per master plan. And then HKGI um, <coughs> and MSA are on the high end with 15,000 for MSA for each master plan and then um, HKG GI at 14.9.13.7 on the master plan. These are people all qualify? They all qualify, yes. You say Cedar Corp did the last one, Sean? Uh, no, um, last one was done by MD Roffers. As far as the um, corp, and they didn't want to do this with his work load right now. He did not want to provide a, a proposal at this time, um, and we kind of figured based on the timeline that we put together that we probably would be adjusting the timeline that was put in the proposal, just because obviously there's a lot going on for the village right now, and we gave them a March deadline. So one of the Questions that they had was would we would we negotiate changing the completion date on it uh, just due to timing and getting it out there? It's not the ideal time to do an update just due to people aren't thinking about outdoor recreation and but it is also a good time to get those people together to discuss it. You know, um, as far as doing master plans and stuff like that because you you meet with all the outside groups, the youth groups, etc. And you know, getting those meetings in place along with you know our strategic planning sessions we have coming up this fall and in the winter, um, et cetera. So we figured that the timeline may change um, as far as completion. I guess in that respect, I would say we would want to complete our strategic planning <clears throat> effort first, because there may be things identified there that would be um, relevant to the the corp. And, uh, Park master plans, plus with the other, with all that activity going on, trying to have additional meetings and whatnot, I think would be a kind of a tough ask for the staff and for the, even the community getting together on that. So, that would be, I, I would think this is something we'd be talking about doing after the first of the year. Um, and, and we are a, a, a little bit, our plan is a little bit different because it is part of the comprehensive plan also. It's a entire has its entire chapter within the comprehensive plan. So, 
um, along with another section. It's in another section. There's another section that um, the park is part of, or the court plan is part of the town plan also. So there's actually two sections within the within the town plan that are parks. I'm going to ask you, I think it's maybe a dumb question, but are they considering the Green Hex Center when they're looking at the long-term master plan? <clears throat> well, that's why you meet with all the outside groups is you want to incorporate, you know, all the user groups in the area. So you're talking like, would they consider, I guess I'm just looking at like soccer fields, right? I mean, there, there, there's never been an indoor soccer field. So everything was, has been played outside of, the field now with our high school games moving indoors to this facility because usually the weather is crappy in spring. Right. <laughs> um, it is that. And, and therefore that affects your use of that, you know, I guess that was just one of my thoughts. Mm -hmm. It is an indoor soccer <laughs> field right now in the Green Hack Field House, mm -hmm. but not that size. Yeah, but not the size. Play games. Yeah, the yeah. size he proposed tonight is the size of an outdoor right. soccer field. Th that's why I was asking the question, are they yeah. incorporating that facility into the master plan of what their needs are. So the, you're saying our master plan would incorporate their facility as far as? Would you look at it? As are, are, they, yeah. are they looking at the impact of it is my, is my question, right? Because it just seems to be like, and my kids all grew up playing soccer. You couldn't play soccer indoor before. And I knew, I know they had a field, but you couldn't play games on it right now. All of a sudden, boom! You have that capability. So the outdoor field now, mm -hmm. you know what? Then maybe you don't need another soccer. Field. Might be, yeah, right. Right. In, in our parks have completely trended away from soccer. Um, we don't actually have any youth soccer on any of our parks anymore. Uh, where Kennedy Park used to be the JV and varsity soccer fields prior to the middle school complex going in. So soccer pretty much went away. Youth soccer moved to middle school complex. And MC United moved to, is it River Valley? The East Atlanta. Bay Complex, the, the East old land well. Um, so we literally have transitioned away from soccer where we have a rugby pitch at Kennedy now, and then we have a, just an open grass field area um, that used to be a soccer field. But prior to that, we had, um, we had like 16 micro fields that we painted at Kennedy during soccer. Um, we also painted the Weston School site, which was Weston School. Um, Kelly Land Park um, still has four dedicated soccer fields there. Um, but literally all that is, if it's used, it is currently only used for rec bike practice. If they're looking for a practice site. So um, they look, they do look at those trends, though, that if there's, and they meet with these groups. So it's no different than we met with. Uh, D service school district. We met with youth baseball, youth softball a few months ago because we're all looking at what we're doing individually and we're not looking at it together. So, like, it should be a district wide baseball, softball, you know, and school district plan. What, what does our area need for facilities when we're looking to do that? So, as you saw, the Greenock Turner site is going to. They're going to lose one of the, the JV softball field at um, the school. They don't have a plan to replace that at this point. So next next spring, if they break ground, they don't have a site for JV softball. So they're looking for a site. Um, so they're talking. They, they threw out a lot of different ideas, like piggybacking their games, so JV and varsity playing both on the varsity diamond. Obviously, that's not ideal in April. Um, after school, late games, very cold, pretty tough to do. They talked about, you know, they talked with us, we talked with youth baseball about using Kennedy Park possibly, um, just because they, their season is usually done by when ours, is, when the ones here really start rolling. Um, but they're also talking about building a complex over at Western School. So at least we met, we talked about that stuff and that's what we want to do. <laughs> In the future, you know, when we're master planning, it was, does it make sense? Does the school need more fields? I mean, school currently uses our large diamond for, you know, freshman and JV practices. They alternate back and forth because they only have two baseball fields. You know, next year they'll have four teams. They'll have um, at least, you know, one varsity, two JV at least, and a freshman team, or two freshmen and JV, so four teams. They have two fields to practice, but they use Kennedy also. So 
it just makes sense to incorporate all those ideas in when you're talking about master planning. And is Kennedy Park the right location for baseball field? Who's, who says it is right now? You know, I mean, like you said, you're adding traffic to the uh, school site. You know, Kennedy is a, like a, I would say a tourist site. It's not your neighborhood park. I mean, they host baseball four nights a week, hosted three terms this past season, this past year. Um, you know, so people are coming from outside town to come here. I mean, they had a rugby game here on, back on the 27th. And, you know, so we are drawing people to that park as a more of a tourist site versus just your neighborhood park. But it is also used as a neighborhood park based on, you know, the people that live around it. But, you know, all those surrounding communities, uh, you, you know, you baseball the kids are from all the surrounding communities too, so. If I heard you properly, can we extend this date out on this? Can we get a resubmittal to get more quotes on this or, um, or is there, this is a proposal process, so it's not a bid, if you will. So we're not bound to a low price. I, I think this comes down to who he feels the most qualified. So do we have enough information to make that judgment? I guess another way we could do this is interview any firms. That we may, they can ask some of, the, some of the questions that are being asked here, I guess. But I'm, what, what I'm asking is you gave a deadline of March to have this done. And we basically hit everybody's, it's, I mean, People are trying to fit this in. Does it have to be done by March in your eyes? Not in my eyes, I guess. It does not. Does not. So if we if we put this out there, uh, it's hey, we just need this project done by June or July. Is that feasible? Yeah. And if we yeah, can, can, we, can we get a can we get a lower price, or maybe we can get the existing guys in here to do this for? I mean, are you are we happy with uh, ropers or roffers or whoever did the last one? He's going to be doing the update for the housing and transportation and land use. So we'll be using him for the updates we need to make for the comprehensive plan. And then we're going to have to incorporate anything from the corp into that park and rec function. I, th I think as far as the corp, yes, we're happy with everything he's done. He's not a master park planner though. So we may want to use a different contractor or a different consultant for that. Um, because he does work with like DRXNL studios for his graphic master plan and stuff. So it's not something that he does all in house, uh, but there are some park planners like Rettler is a park planner. I mean, we've used them on Stevens point. They are, they do almost all park stuff. We've done it for a long time where, you know, some of these just are starting to get their leg in the door doing some park stuff, or they have so many people that they do everything. Yeah, you know. So the point of it is, is if we can extend this date out four or five more months, can we get some of these numbers to come down? Because these guys may say it's a longer stretched out project. We don't have to concentrate so many hours. We've got mm -hmm. this much of a workload, so on and so forth. That's what I'm getting at. Yeah, it, and it's very possible. So the only reason for the deadline was because really because if we want to apply for any stewardship funding for next year, we need to have a plan document. Okay. So as long as we're not planning on applying for any funds next year, it doesn't need to be completed. What are them funds total, Sean? What's that? Yeah, I guess, Matt, what are those funds? What can you get from these funds? How much does that cost versus what we could yeah. save? What's the ROI? So you mean the, the what, stewardship grants? What kind of grant funds are available? Yeah. Oh, there's like usually 15, 20 million available. How we much get do you get? 20 million or we get? How much like, do you get? Yeah. How much do we get? We have to apply for it. So we have to have based on the project, historically speaking. So if you usually, I think that's what, are they 50-50? They're 50-50 matching grants. So if we had a $40,000 improvement, we could potentially get $20,000. So like, grants. so the Oak Clear River Trail, we got uh, $88,000 in grant funds. Um, Mock Miller Park. So I guess the importance, that, that, that's what we need to hear. Okay. We need to hear the importance of this in order to make our education. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't quite understand what you're saying with this. Yeah. yeah, it is 50 50 matching. So, what do you got projected for what you would ask for grants for? Do you know? That's where some of the it's master plan, the master plan, plan identify what's right. Yeah. yeah. So, we got to have this done by what time? You have to have it completed by February, March? Uh, we don't need to. They, they do a fall round. 
of grant applications too, which is coming up. So we we could be done if we're done by like August. Like I said, they do two grant process, two timelines and it's per year. You you would be can you get two? Or would you just uh, you just apply for one? Okay. Yeah. You can do so there's still time to get you it. can do multiple projects though too. Okay. So this needs to be done in March for the spring round. Yeah, or August or, or yeah, August. or end of August. Yeah. Okay. But it, but once you once you, you you really probably need to have a, a month prior to that, Sean. It's not like they're going to give you this plan, and at, at that point, you have to you have to decide what you're going right. to do. You, you have to you have to apply for this grant, so right. you're going to need a little bit of leeway. Right, right. Yeah. And the grant applications for them are very extensive. Yeah. We've received multiple grants, like I said, Mockingbird Park, the trail, the launch. Um, so since we've moved into the, um, somebody brought up need. Maybe it's appropriate to bring the baseball guys up now to talk about sort of their vision for this. I mean, because we can't put a dollar amount to this until we have that discussion, right? Put a dollar amount to the... I mean, if we're looking ahead, like we want to apply for $90,000 in grant dollars, but they, you know, they haven't articulated what they want to do yet. So, well, there's also limitations. So most of the grant funds available are for like passive use, active recreation, not organized sports. There's typically a small amount available for like playground equipment, sports fields, et cetera. Almost all the money is available for work, walking trails, uh, you know, development of the, that type of stuff, not organized sports. So you're really limited. It's a very small amount, maybe a million dollars a year. And there's a lot of people that apply for it. So as far as the development of like future baseball fields, that's you're gonna be limited on any funds available for that. They would be more like Prohaska because we thought it was gonna be a, a passive use type park with you know bike paths, walking trails, you know, there's five ponds there, maybe some fishing piers, because there's some fish in there, you know, just walking paths, <laughs> maybe some support facilities. So you know, maybe a restroom or a shelter where people can still picnic, but really limited development. I mean, that park could be built probably cheaper than most parks can because you're not doing massive groundwork. Yeah. You know, you know how it was mowed before, there is walking paths there already. Mm -hmm. They literally just need improvement. So if it's something that the village would like to move forward with and develop that park, then obviously having the corp done, having it in that plan, then being able to apply for those grant funds would be advantageous. Uh, Director Osterbrink, why was why were no funds budgeted for the Kennedy Master Plan? Because we didn't anticipate doing it this year. So there are funds budgeted in the in the current 2022 budget for the board. But it doesn't mean we can't. We have floated the idea out there that some of this American Rescue Plan Act funds could could be devoted to these plans. Okay. If you recall the document we put in front of the board, mm -hmm. as I've said before, I'm not, I'm not a fan of spending my grandchildren's money, but it's out there for everybody. We have we have an allocation, Village of Weston, of $2.2 million to spend on public projects, essentially. And 10% of that each was devoted to SAFER and EMPD already. So we have still to decide how we're spending the balance of the funds. Okay. Sean, do you or any other staff have a preference on any one of these firms? Um, I don't know if we've worked with any of them before in the past. I mean, I went through all the 20 plus page proposals from all these guys and some of them have really great graphics and stuff. But just because they have great, great graphics and stuff doesn't mean that that makes us a better park or makes us a better decision on a park. Right. And, we, and we've and we worked with, well, I mean, myself have worked with MSA um, on the skate park project. Rettler has done some uh, park plans for us previously, uh, but those would be the two that I'm limited to. I'm sure the village has worked with Ayers and probably Cedar Corp. Cedar Corp, I am working with a little bit more uh, late, um, including I believe that one of the guys on the project, he actually does the zoning for the town of Wrangell. So um, I've interacted with him recently, actually. So. 
and they're getting more into um, the area on plans and things like that, or, or being basically staff for different smaller communities. And as you can see, I mean, just like um, MSA, I mean, their, their closest location is Marshfield, but the, the head person on the plan is out of Madison. And it's somebody that's been doing it um, for MSA since they came on board, because they literally wanted to get into the park arm of, um, you know, consulting. Um, and that was, she, they, she's been there a long time, though. So they've been in it a long time. MSA actually did the original extraterritorial zoning. Uh, and the town's conference of plan back in 2006, 2007. So I've worked with I'm just saying, some of these from low end to high end, you're paying more than double the price. Are you getting double the value for your, your dollar? Probably not. I, yes, the graphics are better in your report, but it tells you, hey, this is what, this is what the community needs for a park load, and this is how we think you could or should build it. That's what we're looking for on these, right? Right, right. And if you look at our current core, um, actually it was done with in-house as far as the uh, mapping, et cetera, was done by the village. And was that an option in here? Do we look at what it would cost to do it in-house? I mean, uh, this is probably- in Well, that, that, actually this does, in, this, does, this, does, this does include us doing the mapping in-house. Okay. okay. But any of this other work, no one here Sit on this table or work on the other side of the wall is qualified to do any of this other stuff? I think it's a question it's of a time, time, question. The time, right. the time that we are not able to devote to it. I think it's this is the kind of thing we would rely on an outside consultant to do a lot of this leg work. Um, we'll certainly be involved in input. All these, all these plans or projects require interaction with village staff. It's just getting the, you know all this detail done there. Difficult with the staff the size we have. I had that say. I asked Sean that say. I asked you that same question a couple of weeks ago, and you just kind of came back with, "Well, it, it's nice to get an outside eye to look at it." And, and they, they spend the time doing all the work, so they they're scheduling all the public meetings. They're scheduling the meetings with all the outside groups. Um, you know, so they're taking care of obviously a lot of that as far as the planning and actually figuring out what this area needs right now. Like I said, is baseball right for Kennedy Park? I don't know, maybe they'll tell us it doesn't make sense to do it. Um, we also had input from a, another trustee that said, well, does it make sense to you know, cover the pool? Does it make sense to cover the pool? I can't answer that question. I mean, I could give you my opinion on it, but I don't have the expertise, obviously, in running an indoor facility like that. So, um, but, you know, so, it's just a lot of that. So many things you got to look at. Traffic. Yeah. What 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 else does the area have? To, I mean, nobody here has the time to. Yeah. I mean, we've had pickleball come in and do a proposal here. Does it make sense to put pickleball courts? And where should we put them? I'm not saying existing staff per se, but if, if I've got fifty five thousand dollars budgeted for this, and this is only from now until March, gosh, that's not even six months. So if I've got two of these projects, that's $110,000 a year. You pay one or two or three people. Any of this yeah, I don't budget. think that you would have budgeted. Sound like you only have. Yeah, we have 14.5 budgeted. 14, 14, this budget. isn't our only outside thing. contracted thing though, right? Um, Didn't you say you had somebody going so, for? Well, so she's good. I so have to so, do an update of the comprehensive plan. Yeah, so she has some amendments. Right, you said Rolfers is doing something right now. He's most likely going to be doing that yeah sure we have not started it it would be i'm just seeing zooming out new if budget. all of the outside dollars that we spend for consulting can we just hire a consultant and put them on staff here would that make more well, financial sense that's pretty probably much not right. we don't know that we have a continued need for a lot of consultants so I think you have to you have to understand there'd be benefits and yeah so i do have budget staff, numbers i just don't know how you find the expertise you can have a variety of expertise you're looking for. So my budget universe. includes money to, and it has for a number of years for, and this started with the, um, basically with Camp Phillips Center. I have some money budgeted in case things get a little crazy and we're not able to do site plan review in house. So if we have five or six site plans that come in, well, who gets, you know, we can say, okay, you're first. But I have the ability in my budget to have 
Mark Rothers assist us with that. So he would do it on an hourly basis. We've not had to do that. We do that occasionally with some of the code amendments that the plan commission has wanted to do just because, you know, he wrote the original code so he can make sure we're not changing sections of the code that affect different sections. So we specialize in it, Jim. Yeah. Right. That's your specialty. Right. And he can do it without, you know, he knows what it is. We just tell him exactly what you guys are requesting and we can go about doing our other work with the citizens and he can work on that for us. If, so I have that ability. If, so how often does a corp update really required to be done? It's every five years. So it's not every year. It's well, no, no, years. I, I'm not talking just this plan. I'm saying all of the outside consulting that we have. To his point, there's other projects that we hire consultants for. Don't we hire I understand consultants. what you're saying. Yeah, it's just a matter of but they all have different levels of expertise. Yeah. All different. Different. There's so many different avenues and sources that we have to pull from. It's no different than in any one of our businesses. You can't have, you know, we just can't I have somebody that's good staff to do specialize in everything uh, and do it to the level that's required for the, to, to apply for this funding. I mean, it, it's fun. I, I think it's reasonable. I guess my. I, I see the huge disparity between the upper limit and and uh, um, I mean it, it is double. And I look at the companies and how many years they've been in business; they all look like they're reputable. Yeah. And so when you look at the, the value proposition, does the cheapest guy deliver the, the what you need in order to meet? The federal requirements for that update, and uh, so I, I and I think the answer to that is you both worked on them both before, and they've done us a good job. Yeah. yeah. Well, there hasn't been any work with Sierra Corp on a plan like this. Not on a project no. that I've worked with. Them. We haven't worked with them personally, where we hired them as a consultant. Sierra Corp. And they're supplying references that right. Right. And you know, like HKGI, they're the ones that are located the farthest away. They're in Minneapolis. Right. And if you look through the, what their proposal was, you can see that they really have no corp plan experience because corp is something for Wisconsin. All the plans that they do in Minnesota are called something else. So it's hard to say they have they have limited experience on corps, but they do. Have tons of plan, done tons of park plans. They might have different requirements, and maybe that's why they're the highest one on the list in order for this thing. Sure. When they've got more travel expenses, no, no, parks, parks. Parks. That's, this is yeah. Yes, I mean, ultimately, between these two, I think you got to the two low bidders, both of them are reputable. You just got to interview them and feel who you think is the best. And then it, I, I don't think it's a bad idea to extend out to see what uh, Ruffers has got for. If he couldn't get into the schedule before March, maybe he's got time April, May, or June, or even if you extend that out, extend the date out to all of them and say, does this help with budget? We're over budget. Simple as that. We're over budget. You know, maybe they'll come back with some concessions that it got stretched out. I guess I would like to have the park department and them make the comments because this actually will be a, a park decision. Mm -hmm. Anybody? Oh, okay. Then, well, I guess I just wanted to go <laughs> and see what you said, Gary. I, I guess it boils in. Why are we here? Why are we here? You want me to be a. Uh, no, this was a joint meeting, but there was the part with the. Um, it's actually, can I explain? Because sure. the Planning Commission is going to be involved. One of the functions of the Planning Commission is park planning. Um, so we have to incorporate this into the village's comprehensive plan. So they have to be involved because they're going to have to update the comprehensive plan um, to make sure that they're consistent because he's going to score higher if we also have this information in our comprehensive plan. That's why we did it originally that way. We incorporated the corp into the plan. It just scores higher <coughs> and it's just better planning. Uh, let's take you know he's had his hand up a little bit yeah i don't know what the question is on the table anymore mm -hmm. yeah so are are we talking about 
making a decision to hire a consultant? Are we talking about, I mean, these guys showed up. I, I don't know what the question is. I mean, so if I can, yeah. we haven't heard anything from, I didn't, I guess I was observing or hearing any commentary from the park committee, but I echo Geary's sentiment here. I, I, in my mind, this decision boils down to the Cedar Corp, because they have the expertise that we want for this project. Otherwise, I believe Brettler is the choice. Now, I think to make that decision maybe takes a little more evaluation. Take a look at what's on the resume. I know the Brettler proposal includes a lot more work in the state. Cedar Corp had a, you know, just a few plans for town type governments, the way I saw it there. I guess, I, again, I have no preference. I guess I, I think maybe it takes a little more evaluation. I think that's always another option when we have these proposals. We don't need to make a decision off this information alone. We can do, a lot of times you get doing interviews. I don't think it's productive for us to go and start shopping numbers around. I think people don't like that. And, um, you know, they've already given their proposal on this project. Unless we're changing the scope somehow, I guess the only thing we've talked about is, you know, a different timeline. I'm not sure that would help, but we can, I guess that could be, that could be discovered, but I really do think the decision should just, it, in my mind, based on the proposals I read and whatnot, I think it's, and, and, the, and the price range that they've given, I think it's, I would say it's a choice between Rutler and Cedar Corp. I would no. agree. If it was, if it was me off this information, I would, I would say Rutler. Personally. The only reason why I'm asking for a time extension is because Sean had mentioned that the Roffers had did the first one. They've got all the corp stuff already done. Why wouldn't we entertain an estimate from them if it should save a bunch of time by extending the time? Export in the park master plan. I think that was as far as the, Sean. as far as the park master plans. Okay, it might sum that part what up. What I'd like to suggest is. The park committee select three of these consultants, interview with them, right. and then recommend to the board the yeah. final choice. Well, um, the the only uh, the only um, thing that I have, or the only small issue I have with that, uh, Trustee Zagami, is that that would cut out the planning commission from also weighing in, and and as Director Higgins said. Um, Park planning is part of plan commission's uh, purview. So I'd like, so. Well, the park, uh, the planning commission can also make a suggestion or share in that decision making, selecting three consultants in that interview. By doing that, you're eliminating some extra work and also you're selecting the best out of a five to interview them and come out with final decision. So you're not going just with the price. If if that's um, then I think because we have Cedar Corp as the ultimate low bidder and Rottler, uh, that seems to that seems to have substantially more uh, substantially more experience. Um, then why don't we just narrow it down to those two rather than a third one? The third is Roffers. Oh, Roffers, thank you. Well, Cedar Corp, it's gonna tell you, look, in the, look, in the, look down on Cedar Corp. Corp development update experience, limited. Master plan development experience, limited. Yeah, I mean, if not look, disagreeing. Yeah, if you look at the communities that they have as references, um, you know, Prescott, Troy, Prescott, Troy Union are, I think, like 2,000 population. Right. Uh, Little Chute, Alloway, Grand Chute, Plover, even Oregon. I mean, those are those are all very comparable, very comparable population-wise. So I think you know, having that experience of similar population sizes, even people that are in metro areas, I guess you know, they understand how the neighboring community maybe has something, so you don't have to focus on that. I think before you look at the cost, you look at mm -hmm. qualification. Mm -hmm. Then you look at the cost because we got the low price. That doesn't mean that's the best choice. So I think we should look at the qualification, then consider the price also.
Do any of the three park committee members have a anything anything they'd like to add? I don't think it's necessary to interview three different firms. It, there's two choices on the board right. that many of us seem to gravitate towards. Yeah. And so if, if there's if you can't make a decision between those two with what's already been presented to us, okay, interview them, but I guess I would be confident making a choice based on the information that we've already been given. What more is an interview going to give us? What are you going to ask for that would change your mind one way or the other? When you request for interview, you ask the individual who's going to do the job, actually, give the presentation. Then you see and you can feel what he knows, what he doesn't know, and you can ask a question directly from him. It's up to you, however. That's my recommendation. That's what I would do, but I'm sure there's a better idea out there. Okay, so what is the question that we're back to again? So, um, yeah. Yeah. so there's two, there's two questions. One, who to go with. Second of all, the scope of the overall project. Do we want just the core update? Um, just the core update. Do we want Corp and and Prohaska? Do we want Corp Prohaska and Kennedy? Uh, and then, um, let's see. That's on page. 11 and then the costs are on oh costs are right there also on page 13. in my opinion i think if we're going to do it we may we should do all three of them absolutely i was just going to say why do it if we don't I, do them all that's my rule so did you want to make the motion um sure if i could read it <laughs> <laughs> um what do i need to do i recommend approving you can you can put all three in together, but it's it's right if you're recommending a specific yeah. consultant. Yeah, that's where it, where you put it in, in there, and then you could just say the complete corp update and both master plans. Sure, I recommend approving Wetler to do the corp update and the master plan. Second. Okay. We'll motion a second. I guess. Any other questions? Let be a park committee. It'd be a park committee. Yeah. 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 Okay. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that was the park recommendation. I'll entertain a motion from planning. Ditto. Second. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Motion motion by Garrett. Who, who has who has the second? Second. second by Jordan. On the question. Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 So carried. Um, unless there's anything else, I think that wraps us up. I believe you're right. Motion to adjourn. Can I do my? Do you mind? This gentleman came in. Do you want, do you want to listen to I, whether it's uh with anybody's time or not it would just be respectful if they did come in to speak maybe give them an opportunity maybe i'm wrong i don't know that's what the yeah. Sure. 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 i'd like, be more than happy <laughs> not on the agenda yeah it, yeah and it's up to the discretion of the chairs to allow or disallow what would the rest of the committee like to do i'd like to hear them. allow it okay if you could, if you don't mind stating your name and address for the record. My name is Tim May. I'm at 5303 Winding Creek Drive in Weston. Um, so I was asked to come here today by some of the representatives from every youth baseball to kind of listen in and what was going on. I honestly didn't know this was going on this evening. Um, I spent about the last 10 years in youth sports, either as president of youth hockey, vice president of youth baseball. I've coached baseball. I've coached lacrosse. Um, I have kids right now in Everest, um, all athletes, um, not originally from the area. I moved up here about 25 years ago and I travel quite extensively for my job. And I think that's important because I travel a lot and because my kids are in sports and I have to deal with Kennedy Park and I deal with the Greenhead Fieldhouse and the Ice Center and we try to find lacrosse fields to look at. I see what other communities are doing. Okay. 
And if I'm a family of young kids and I want to move to the central Wisconsin area and I have children that are four or five and six and they've been playing sports, whether it be baseball or whatever it is, in other places, I want to move to a community, community where they can continue to participate. Uh, we've been up here before talking about baseball. We have Kennedy Park. Listening to the lady before about the Green Act Turner Center and about the economic impact, we run about a thousand baseball players through a tournament weekend. And that doesn't, that, that, I take, take that back, about a thousand people, when you're talking players, parents, siblings, grandparents, and they come from the Valley, they come from Madison, they come from Eau Claire, and they are seen in hotels and they're eating in our restaurants. So we may not have the economic impact of 25,000 people, but we sure have the economic impact of about 3,500 people. And the facility that we have at Kennedy is woefully underdeveloped for what our needs. We don't have a significant or a proper concession stand. We don't have proper restroom facilities. We have to bring in our own um, porta potties for lack of a better term. A lot of times the, the, um, the restrooms aren't even open and that's only because of vandalism and stuff like that. Um, I don't, my own personal opinion, I don't know if Kennedy has the room to support what we need. We probably need anywhere from three to four at least uh, fields. And then comes the parking issue. When you compete with the pool, there's not a lot of parking, not a lot of street parking, and you have neighbors. Um, <clears throat> I'm just sitting here listening to everything I said, and, and now we have the um, the people coming in to determine what this community needs. Um, I know about Prohaska Park as being on the on the um, baseball board and understand what it what it could offer. Um, you know, in thinking the needs of um, the high school, and I'm really glad you guys passed um, for moving ahead because, as they alluded to, the softball field is gone next spring. So they are going to be in desperate need of another softball field. I don't know if you guys have ever seen the baseball field at the junior high, but it's abysmal. There's no outside fence. So honestly, if I, if I were on your board and, and, and I had to give my two cents, I would say we work with the school district to bring in a softball field and a baseball field utilized by the school district at Kennedy right across the street. Put a nice path in there, a walking path. They can use the park at the high school and they can walk the 300 feet to play. Use Prohaska Park as the youth baseball and, and, and youth softball. It's easily accessible from Weston Avenue or from Schofield Avenue by Ryan. The, the traffic is gonna be intermittent and when you're talking about bringing kids from either Cronin or the Rothschild, Schofield, Weston, just for rec baseball, they will go there. I mean, they're not, they're, they're not going to tell their four-year-old they're not going to play baseball because they have to drive an extra two miles. Um, they already go out to Mock Mueller, but bring them all in at, at one, on one facility. And then people coming in from outside the area for our, our tournaments. Um, we, we're doing the best we can with Kennedy. Um, but it's, it's, it's a long way to go. And we want them to have a very positive experience. We do our best as a youth baseball team. What we can, we can't do a lot with the facility itself. During COVID, oh my gosh, if the, the, the problems we had with the porta potties was, was terrible. We couldn't get, you know, this is not your problem, but we couldn't get them to come in and pump them out. And they were flowing and people weren't using them and they were going to quick trip and it really put a black eye on us. So, I think it's vital, not only to the baseball association or to softball, but for the community, that when people are going to move into a community and pay taxes and they have children, that they know that, hey, there's a place for my kid not to sit there and play on his computer, but he wants to play baseball and he wants to play soccer or whatever sport it is. And he has a good place to go and a good organization behind them. So I commend you guys for moving forward. Hopefully we don't kick the can down the road and we get this done because my kids have aged out. I have two freshman twin boys and a senior at the high school. Um, but I really hope that if I have grandkids and we're still around here, that they will have a, re a really great facility to play in. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Wait, hold on. Oh, sorry. 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 Come on. Come on.
<laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't. I thought you were. I was trying to hide. <laughs> um, so I'm Lucas Sheraton. Uh, I live at 1825 Spring Street in Schofield. Uh, I'm the treasurer for DCF for Youth Baseball. Um, so we've been kind of meeting with Parks and Rec for a number of years, and we're working with the village. And uh, as as a representative for DCF, we, we're really thankful for the new backstops that are at Kennedy Park on Jones One and Two. Uh, they look amazing. Um, it's going to hopefully then really help. Um, Kids are getting excited about baseball again this fall. We had a lot of kids out at the park for evaluations for our next year's travel teams already this last weekend. Um, one thing that as an organization is we do um, invest um, also in the park to for improvements as well. Um, and as a board recently, we have actually um, approved investing more money into potentially looking at creating one of those fields into a 50, 70 field. So as kids get older, we, we currently have a 4660 field and a 6090 field. So there's a pretty big transition when their age is about 11 and 12. Um, for It's a pretty big jump. And what we're finding a lot of communities in our area are going to is a 5070 field or a tra middle transition field. Um, so that's something that we're, we want to try to help the, the parks and rec and, and the village as well as to create that intermediate field. So that way we can continue to bring in more teams um, for tournaments, we actually had that age group was probably our lowest attended age group for tournaments this summer. Part of that was because the schools south of us are used to playing on a 5070 or a slightly larger field. So when they found out it was a 4660, they opted to back, to back out. So that did have a little bit of an impact on us as well. And it's just disappointing for us um, as a league and an, or, and an organization to know um, that we're potentially hindered in that aspect for that. So. Um, I commend and, and appreciate the village moving forward with doing a, a master plan. Um, that's something we've been hoping for probably for a couple of years now. So um, we're really excited to have that going forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? No. All right. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. To adjourn. <laughs> motion by Zagami, second by Mumper. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, we should adjourn the park committee too right away. Motion to adjourn the park so committee. I'll second by Roger. By Dino. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So okay. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't get this one.